In the 21st century, how ethical is street photography? Hello, welcome to In Studio. I'm Ian M. Butterfield. Is street photography still ethical in the 21st century, or is it an invasion of privacy? These are some of the questions I tried to tackle in a recent live stream where I looked at not only the ethics of uh, street photography, but some of the techniques that we can do to mitigate uh, the ethical dilemmas of invasion of, pri of privacy. How do we go about getting permission without ruining the shot? There are times when it's we need explicit permission and sometimes it can be inferred and we just need an implicit permission. Let's join the live stream as I look at this topic. Right, street photography, that's our topic for the night. Uh, the first thing I need to say is a disclaimer. I am not a street photographer. Um, well, I say that, I do do it to a certain extent and you'll start, as we go through, you'll understand how, why and when I do it. But I wouldn't call myself a street photographer. I very, very rarely, in the UK anyway, go out to do street photography work. Uh, and there are reasons for it. I'm going to look tonight in the first section about the ethics of street photography the rights and wrongs of it, why we do it, whether it's important, why it's important, and all those sorts of things, and some of the problems with it. And for me, one of the key problems with street photography is um, the, the issue of consent and invasion of, uh, of privacy. And I'm going to talk fairly extensively about that tonight and how I justify some of the things that I do, how I obtain con consent. And it's not always by just asking someone. I want to go through that. Um, and I'm going to look at some case studies, some individual images that I've created, uh, and I'll delve into them and bring out a few lessons from those. And one particular thing, which was a, a series of images that I created at a water fight in the Azores. It were great fun, uh, but I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. Uh, it was really fun to photograph and to be part of. Uh, right, let's just start by, I want to start by telling you not about my ph street photography, but about somebody else's. The photographs of um, a woman called Shirley Baker, who died in um, 2014, and she left behind a body of work uh, which includes a lot of street photography stuff, but very, very specific stuff. And it's all about Manchester and Salford, and she photographed the, the Salford slums before they were pulled down. And this is the website. The link is on the screen. The link's also in in the printed notes as well. Uh, do have a look at it at some point. Some amazing images they've put here. But one of the interesting things I find about it is if you notice on just about every shot, there's always somebody looking at the camera. So she is working with her subjects People are aware of her uh, creating the images. Uh, I think that's the, one of the few exceptions where there isn't someone looking at the, at the camera um, on there. But people are still looking very natural in them. And the thing that comes out from these images for me is the fact that she has, it appears, that she has obtained consent from the people she's photographing. They're not um, intrusive. They are not things which are done behind someone's back and things like that. Street photography is typically a record of a time and a place. 
And that's what those um, photos by Shirley Baker are all about. It gives a real insight into what Salford was like in the, the 60s, 70s and 80s. And that's the general period. And I think 1950s as well. I think the, fir the earliest ones are about 1950 in there, but the colour ones tend to be 60s onwards. And uh, I'm old enough to be able to remember bits of Manchester that looked like uh, those photos. I didn't know Salford in those days, but I certainly um, um, rem I certainly remember Manchester looking like that and bits of Stockport looking like that. Um, interesting comments just come in from Sue. Um, she says, uh, a lot of the people who featured in Shirley's photographs have spoken on Facebook groups, identifying themselves and remembering having their photos taken. So yeah, uh, she wasn't trying to do this uh, surreptitiously. She wasn't trying to hide the fact that she was uh, making photographs uh, at the time. And that for me is, uh, is important. Uh, but yet she's had this ability to make people appear natural in there. They don't, on the whole, look posed photos. And I hope that what little bit of street photography that I do, that I'm aiming to do the similar sort of thing where people know I'm doing it, but they are still able to be natural. I have obtained their consent either explicitly or implicitly. And this is the, the, the big debate with street photography, that invasion of privacy versus natural images. Because what most people say who do street photography is the moment you ask someone's permission, it ruins the scene, it spoils the scene, it's no longer natural. And I, that certainly can be the case, but there are certain things you can do to minimize that effect. First of all, let's talk about the law on this. We need to think about it. And I've got a link here, um, amateur photographer. They've covered this far better than I can. Right, yeah, amateur photographer uh, have done this article uh, about street photography and the law. And it's, it's quite a good summary of the thing. So I'm not going to repeat everything there. Take the time, go have a look at that uh, yourself on there. And you notice the, uh, one of the, the high up things on here about respecting privacy on there. Be sensible to cultural differences. Also very important. I would call myself a travel photographer. And it may come as a surprise to some of you, I would consider myself more of a travel photographer than a studio photographer. Uh, and one of the things as a travel photographer I'm always aware of is the cultural differences in the places I'm, uh, I, I'm at. And they talk about other things, about um, not obstructing and the things like that. Um, and I'm not going to go through all that paragraph by paragraph. You can take the time to read that yourself. There are just a few things that I want to say um, about it, uh, which uh, include um, the uh, particular caveats that not everywhere you may think of as being public is actually public. Just because there you have a right to go somewhere does not necessarily mean it is a, uh, a public place. Some parks are owned by private individuals. The obvious example of that is things like the National Trust. In, here near Stockport, Lime Park, um, and you can walk into there from all sorts of directions, is owned by the, Nat the National Trust. And therefore, they can set the rules on what photography you can do there. And their rules are very clear. Yes, you can take photographs, but for personal use only. You cannot sell them on there. So you have to abide by their rules and regulations. Not only that, certain public places have other restrictions on them as well. For example, Nelson's Column, 
and this is a government restriction, I believe, or a royal restriction, I can never remember quite which, is that although it's a public location, Trafalgar Square, you cannot use Nelson's column photos of it commercially. So there are those sort of restrictions. So if you're doing um, street photography and you're planning to sell images, um, then make sure you are aware of the law, what's legal, what isn't. And that article I pointed to is a good starting place on that. The other thing I would say is be very, very careful about photographing children. Now, the legal situation is that it is perfectly legal to photograph anyone, including children, in a public location. Having said that, I would not advise you to do it. It can be misconstrued. You are likely to get yourself into a lot of bother. Uh, I had um, a confrontation with someone when I wasn't photographing children. I was actually photographing deck chairs on the beach. And I was dressed in a photographer's waistcoat with lenses out of every pocket, big uh, rucksack, um, camera with a lens out to here, doing my photography. And this um, woman storms up to me saying, you should be ashamed of yourself photographing children on a beach like this. To which I turn around and say, I'm uh, really sorry, but I'm not actually photographing children. Children, I'm photographing uh, scenes, the deck chairs. I can show you on the back of the camera exactly what I'm. Uh, I've been photographing, and she turned around. And said, I'm not looking at your dirty photos. I said, Well, I'm, there's nothing dirty about them because it's deck chairs. It's not people uh, on on there. And she said, Right, I'm going off to get the police, and off she stormed. And as she was leaving, I said, well, that's OK. I'll wait here until they come, shall I? And um, I did. I waited, knowing full well that she wasn't calling the police. I, I waited for about five minutes. I kept looking over to her um, and she'd gone back to the, the group that she was with. So after about five minutes, I carried, I'd carried on taking a few more shots. I walked over to her with her group, got a card out of my wallet, my business card, handed it to her and said, um, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to go now. Um, I assure you I'm not doing anything untoward, um, but when the police come, if you'd like to give them my card, they can soon catch up with me. And then I just walked off. Um, and it, so I can, if you can get challenged just doing deck chairs out in public, you can get challenged. And if you were photographing children, you are open to getting challenged and getting a lot of abuse. Uh, it's all about a record of a place and time. And I want to show you this image to start off this, um, this section. This is Syria. I was there in 2008. I, had, um, I spent a fortnight in Syria, uh, visiting a lot of the um, archaeological sites there, uh, seeing a lot of places. And I always find it heartbreaking uh, what's happened to that country uh, in, the, in the time since. But on the first day we arrived, we went to this town called uh, uh, Malula. And this, this is without shadow of a, a lie, this is how they sell the bread. Uh, they didn't clean this surface. They just rocked up with this flat bread and just put it on this surface that people had been sitting on and all sorts. I thought, no, 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 I, I really don't want any of your bread. Thank you very much. But this sort of captures that moment in time. And I have other, play, other photos of that town. A couple of years later, that town was absolutely destroyed in the Civil War. So street photography on the plus time site is a record of a time and place. And if we as photographers aren't recording those sort of things, who is for history, for, uh, for future generations? 
But we've got this thing about invasion of privacy, and this is equally valid. And this is the debate, the need for recording and the need for respecting people's um, uh, privacy. Uh, not everyone wants to be photographed, and we need to respect that. Uh, people have a right to privacy. And yes, you have a right to photograph people out in public, but we need to respect those who don't wish to be photographed. So for me, it's all about uh, obtaining consent. Let me give you an example from something that happened to a friend of mine back in the late 70s, early 80s. I was a teenager at the time, and there was an exhibition at Stockport Art Gallery uh, of a photographer. And a friend of mine went to see the exhibition and she was horrified to find there was a photograph uh, larger than life size of her uh, picking her nose. And she was absolutely embarrassed by this. She doesn't know when it was taken. It was clearly taken surreptitiously. It was blown up and it went on public display. And she was absolutely embarrassed by this photograph that was there in the town centre for all to see. And because of that, that had a lasting effect on me with my photography. I don't want to ever create a photograph that I would not be happy showing to the person who I have photographed. And that is the, almost the underlying rule that I have with my street photography. If I would not be happy showing it to the person, I would not want to take it. The slight exception to that would be if it was being used to record something that was happening for evidential reasons and things like that. So that's where I'm coming from. For me, this whole area of consent is vital. And I always, always want to obtain consent when I'm doing my street photography. That does not mean, as we will see, does not mean asking everyone before I uh, make an image of them. And in some cases, I can't. And I'll explain the uh, the exceptions to that, the way I work as we go through uh, this, uh, uh, this section. So one other thing just to say at this stage, um, because I'm a travel photographer, I want to tell you about Bakshish. Bakshish, Bakshish. If you've ever traveled in the Middle East, particularly in Egypt, you will have heard that phrase. And it's usually accompanied by going Bakshish, Bakshish, Bakshish. Uh, along those sort of lines. And this is the implication in some cultures that if you photograph them, people expect to be paid for it. Just a small tip, maybe a few coins, something like that. And it's that understanding, and I know it's the same when I'm, uh, I've come across similar sort of things, not with the phrase bakshish, uh, but in South America as well, when I've been there and uh, other countries um, in um, Middle East and uh, not Middle East, um, uh, in the West Indies as well, that sort of area um, on that. But the phrase bakshish comes from the Persian and it means to pay. So how do I work as a travel photographer? And this is an important safety thing to say. If you are in the habit of um, giving a little bit of money when you're traveling, particularly if you're photographing poor cultures, then put your bakshish money in a separate pocket away from you, the rest of your money. Because people will see you going into a pocket, taking out money, and you become vulnerable to that. So what I do is I have a bakshish pocket when I'm in those sort of countries. And I pull all my loose change that I'm willing to give, uh, the small denominations and things like that, in that one pocket. When I get to the end of that, that's when I stop um, 
uh, taking uh, taking photographs of people uh, uh, there. So it protects me. It gives me a finite amount. I, I've already budgeted, so I'm not just constantly giving out money as well. Right, street photography. Let's talk about this business of consent. I'm going to talk about different ways of obtaining uh, consent. And I'm going to do it by talking about some images and the way there is consent. And consent to me doesn't always mean going up and asking someone's permission. It can mean that, but it's knowing the situation and reading um, the situation uh, to, to know whether there is an implied consent there. This fishmonger in Funchal, um, they are frequently photographed by tourists. It's happening all the time. There is a place where you stand to do the photography. I've wandered around and I actually did uh, start asking permission. And the looks I got were, uh, it was more a sort of, yes. And it felt more like they got more fed up about being asked and being interrupted than by people taking the photograph. So there was an implied consent there by, because I know the location and know what's going on there and that uh, this happens all the time. Um, so that, that's a, one way of getting consent. It's understanding the environment and knowing that in that situation that it is acceptable. Uh, I've not put it up on, uh, on here. Um, there is a photograph in my, my notes. It's it's this one, if you can see it, Cuban man. Uh, when I was in Havana, I had, um, had a tour guide with me uh, who was a, um, a photographer there. And we, he took us on a day going round photographing and effectively doing street photography uh, as well as travel photography there. And I was asking about permission to photograph people. And he said, oh, here in Havana, uh, people just expect it. He said, there's absolutely no problem. Uh, just photograph whoever you want. Uh, you, you won't have any problem doing it. Um, and, and so I did. So there was that sort of, um, that kind of, that consent by it being acceptable, the social acceptability of it in that location at that time. Um, another one, a different type of consent here. This is where the people are aware of you as a photographer and effectively they were asking to be photographed. They spotted me on the balcony. Uh, this was in Mindelo in um, Cabo Verde and they spotted the camera, white lens on there and they waved and said, uh, uh, wanting to have their photograph taken. So I did the polite thing and took a photograph of them. And so there is that. And those sort of situations are actually quite good for obtaining convent, uh, consent then for the more natural shots. You've got somebody who's waved and said, come on, take a photo of me. And I'll then, maybe I'll hang around. I didn't do it with these two guys, but I'll feel comfortable watching for the, I'll say the unguarded moments, the relaxed moments, and continuing to photograph them when they're not posing uh, for the camera. Now, there are other times where it is absolutely impossible to ask permission. And this is an example of it. Uh, I was attracted to this group of people because of the, the primary color of all the t-shirts, but I felt this was not inappropriate because A, they're small in the frame, they're facing away, and if I was to call out to them, the shot would have been gone anyway on there. And so they are anonymized in that particular shot anyhow. And they're so small in the frame, you could equally argue. In fact, for me, the shot is as much about the boats as it is about the people. And also as much about the egret at the bottom as well. So it's a whole composition. So I didn't ask permit, explicit permission there because I didn't feel I was invading their, um, their privacy in, in creating that shot. This is a slightly different one. Again, the captain of a, of a boat. 
I was um, escorting a, a group of tourists from the ship uh, on a tour um, into the Amazon rainforest. And we got there uh, via uh, this little shuttle boat. And here was the captain. I spent most of the time sitting in the seat along, effectively alongside the captain. And I had various lenses on. I was doing a lot of photography. And one of the things I did, I, I didn't want to engage him in a conversation about uh, can I take his photo or not, because he needs to be concentrating on the boat, not trying to pose for me, which can happen when you ask for uh, permission. So what I did is I had the camera and I generally sort of looked in his direction and uh, I, I, I took a shot and I paused and made sure he was aware that I was doing it and that I read his body language at that point and he wasn't being, he didn't come across as being uncomfortable. He looks a little bit scowly in the, um, uh, in the photograph, but actually that's him concentrating on piloting the boat down the, uh, down the Amazon. And uh, I took that as an implied consent uh, on there uh, with that. Here's a, a different one, the cyclist. We'd just come ashore at um, uh, Paratins, I think it was. Uh, we'd used um, boats to get ashore from the, uh, from the ship. And I'd just walked along the jetty and this cyclist came along and uh, had stopped and looked in my direction. I got the cam camera out and I used that universal gesture of uh, indicating between the camera and the person for me to take the shot. And he just looked over his shoulder and grinned and I, I got the shot. But it does, although he's aware of me, uh, it looks a relaxed pose that he was in. So I was very happy with that. So, it, so that was a very positive form of consent um, on, on there. This one, again, is slightly different um, in terms of the permission wasn't granted to me explicitly, but we got the video team from the ship there. They're out of shot. They're just out of shot. They're videoing him bailing the boat out. And this is Alta de Chao. And there'd been a big heavy rainstorm. They just stopped at this point. And this uh, fisherman was bailing his, all the water out of his boat. And the video team, the photography team from the ship were uh, videoing him doing it. And I'd seen that they were, they'd asked permission beforehand and all that. So I was further off uh, when I realized what was going on. And I thought, well, I don't need to ask permission at this point. It's already been granted to other people on the ship. In fact, the official photographers on there. And for me, to call out or to go down and ask would actually ruin the shot for the video team uh, and to interrupt what they were doing to obtain consent that was actually already being given. Uh, so I left this one and just photographed it as it was. Then you have other situations where it's not, it, I would say, it comes under the category of general public not doing anything that's going to be uh, that's an invasion of of, uh, of their privacy or anything so these bikers uh, it wasn't possible to obtain permission from the guy cycling down there how could you do it so I got the shot um, he was aware of me I'm sure he didn't sort of scowl or anything like that. He didn't look uncomfortable with me pointing a camera at him. And I took that as an implied consent uh, on there. No objections made. The final one I want to talk about is what I did with this um, uh, nut seller on the market stall in Belém in, uh, in Brazil. Again, part of the, uh, the Amazon cruise. And it, the, the technique is one I will use a lot with, um, when I'm traveling. And that is, if I'm going to buy a souvenir 
or buy something from a market, I'll walk round and try and find the most photogenic stall to buy it from. Uh, and then I will buy whatever I want. And as I've paid, I'll usually have the camera around my neck. I'll then say, oh, can I take some photos? Uh, or gesture, um, depending on whether I can uh, communicate in English or not. And permission will be granted that way. You'll find that most market stall holders will not refuse if you've just bought something off them. Uh, so it's a great tip to save your souvenir buying um, to, to when you found interesting people and places to photograph. So that's how I did it. I made the purchase and asked. Uh, and I did it that way. It's not my best shot by any way, by any means, but it was a good one for um, uh, to illustrate the point. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to go through some um, images and lesson, pull out some lessons from them. I've got some individual images, and I've got um, an entire shoot. Well, not an entire shoot. Highlights from a particular shoot, which is a water fight in the Azores. So the first lesson I want to pull out is from Sidi Bouside and I'd found this location and this was more about the location rather than the person. I wanted to photograph these, um, these windows and it was one where I needed to wait for a person to walk past to give me perspective. And sometimes uh, street photography is about waiting and that bit of patience wait for the right person to come by and this person looking at their phone um, was the the right thing another example of this and i've i think i've mentioned this in the previous live stream this is a it's a cultural contrast this is in tunis in tunisia i'd identified the um the shot with all the um belly dancing costumes on there and I realized I needed to wait for somebody to walk past to make the shot work. So that was the street photography of it. But I got a little bit of look um, I, and I spotted the woman dressed in the black jilbab um, coming by. And I thought, ah, that's exactly what I need. And then the bit of look was that she just looked over her shoulder uh, at the costumes. So it was that contrast between the sexy belly dancing costumes belly dancing costumes and the very somber um, religious um, jilbab uh, look on there that made the image work. The other thing, and I've mentioned this when I've been reviewing the images, think about your editing and your post-production. This is an okay shot of a street preacher, but it needs simplification. The red buildings, red is a colour that draws the eye. So we look at this and our eye is instantly drawn to that big area of red behind. And the, the people on the left hand side are a little bit distracted. They're not interested. They're not part of the image. They don't add anything to that shot. So what this needs is an edit. And I did two things. I converted it to black and white and chose a mid-tone for that red, which actually neutralizes that pulling of the eye um, on there. Uh, and I've cropped off the people on the left-hand side, and I just took the chance to tidy up the right-hand side as well. But now, because the preacher and the person at the front of the crowd are dressed in light colors, our eye immediately goes to those two, and it becomes a much stronger image for that simplification, that editing that we do in post-production. Uh, this is, again, I want to talk, it goes back to the whole idea of consent, but it's about another technique. And the technique here is what I call ask and wait. I had to ask permission on this because this guy's inside, although it's a street, it is street photography, I was in the street, he's in a very, very small room with an open door onto the, uh, the street in the letter. And as I walked past, I could see here, I thought that would make a great shot. And uh, so I just called to her and said, excuse me, can I, uh, can I take your photo? And he said, yes. And he immediately posed for me, which was not what I wanted. I wanted him at work. So there's a little trick here. 
And I, I use it quite a bit actually with these little posed sh where people start posing. Is I'll, I'll then go, oh, just a minute. And I'll, I'll play with a few things on the camera. And then I'll look up to the person and say, J -j carry on with what you're doing. I'm just going to be a couple of minutes. I need to change a few settings. And I'll spend however long it takes uh, pulling up menus, uh, changing things or and changing them back again until the person has relaxed, carried on with what they're doing. And that's what happened here with this tailor. And you can see in this shot, he's now concentrating on his work. Uh, there's a little bit of blurring of the hands. He's obviously working in there. I've done a little bit of work in post-production. I've tightened the crop in a little bit because I wanted it to feel a bit more claustrophobic because that's what the room was all about on, on there. Let's just talk about street performers as well. And I think it should go without saying, put money in their cap first before you, uh, before you take the shot. And I, I tend to put some money in, wait for their acknowledgement, and then indicate the camera and I'm away. I'll get the, uh, the shots that I want. But here's the extra tip, the bonus tip. Before I even get to that point, I've done something else. Because I don't want to be spending 15 minutes trying to photograph someone, uh, and that's intrusive to them and to the crowds and things like that. Before I even pick the camera up, before I start finding my money to throw into the cap, I'm looking round and I've already tried to find, in my mind, where the correct angle is. So in this case, the levitating man, I'd worked out that I needed to be at the front. I needed to be low down so that we could see underneath him, because if I'd got a position where he lined up with that gap, it wouldn't have worked, the, uh, that line between the wall and the floor, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have looked like he was floating. So I'd already worked that out before I put my hand in my pocket, put the money in the cap and got the permission to take the shot. I'm just going to go through very quickly this water fight and some of the things which uh, uh, lessons from it. it. Happens every Shrove Tuesday in Ponta Delgada in the Azores. It's a huge event, uh, great fun, and it's public. It's very, very public. And there's this impl implication that People are out in public, you're going to get photographed. Um, there's, there's people turn up just to photograph it. Um, and it really isn't practical to ask. You can't come up to someone and say, um, excuse, excuse me a moment, but would you mind if I photographed your reaction to that person who's sneaking up behind you to pour some water over you? Uh, it ain't going to work. So you, you have to just take the shots. But it is like a war zone, uh, and I got soaked doing it, but it was all good fun. And here we go. I mean, because it's public, um, there's the implication you can do it. But the thing to do is to concentrate on the action, and that means thinking about your settings. So um, here I was aiming for fast shutter speed. This particular shot was 125th of a second. Most of my shots were anything between um, 1 200th of a second to 1 1250th and things like that uh, with it. But again, when you're out doing street photography, don't forget the details. This was a water fight and there were uh, containers full of balloons full of water there. Um, I saw one, I thought, wow, that's a lot. And then I saw a lorry turn up and just dump a whole load of bags on the floor full of water for the fight. It's incredible. People turn up in, shot in their own trucks. This was laden with bags of water that they were throwing. And notice what I've done here. I've got the, the, that all important moment when they're actually throwing the bags um, in there. You can see them in midair um, up here, captured in there. So it's all about getting that precise moment. The other thing is think about your lighting as well. Um, and 
think about each individual shot and spend your time thinking about your shots before you start shooting. I realized there was this fight going on in the colonnade and I looked at it and thought, right, where's the light coming from? I want to shoot with the light coming through the water. So although I walked around the other side, I came back to this side and thought, yeah, that's the direction to shoot from. So I stayed at this end to shoot because that was the, the correct position. It's thinking about your shots as you're doing your street photography. And thinking about the reactions as well. And I, I love this reaction shot. Uh, three, uh, three women, um, no, three girls, uh, I, they knew they were going to get water thrown at them. They were walking down the, down the, um, the prom area and uh, somebody came and uh, uh, threw a whole load of water over them. But I just love the reaction shot. And I also love the fact that I've managed to catch it where you can't see any of their faces, but the body language tells the story. And some of those sort of ideas behind um, your images. Uh, it's all about telling the story in your shot. And again, this is one of the ship's um, passengers. Um, and it doesn't stand alone, this shot, but in the context of all the others, it tells the story. The smile on her face, the water, she's soaked, as we all were uh, on that occasion uh, on there. But the other thing with street photography, be aware of your surroundings. There was a point during this uh, fight uh, where things started getting a bit brutal, to be honest with you. Uh, we got a, the fire brigade with their water cannon. We got people who were throwing really quite solid water bombs. One hit me in the face and it stung. Uh, so I had to be vigilant, but it wasn't just about being vigilant for my safety. But you need to do that when you're doing any form of street photography. Some of you have already mentioned in the chat that you've been threatened. So be aware of your surroundings when you're doing street photography. Keep aware of what's going on. But it's not just for that. It's also about uh, making sure you don't miss shots that are going on. I already photographed in the colonnades, but I spotted another colonnade nearby where I got this shot. Again, light coming through everything. And this is one of my favorite shots from the, uh, uh, from the, from the thing. Um, and it's, it brought everything together, being aware of my surroundings when I was creating it, getting the light in the right direction, uh, getting the shutter speed right so I was able to freeze the action, and then onto the post-processing as well, because the black and white conversion is really what makes it work. And you'll notice most of these shots are black and white, not all of them, most of them are. Uh, and I always think black and white works really well for, uh, for street work. But with something like this, don't forget the aftermath. Don't forget the end, the end of the day. If you've been out covering something going on, think about how the day finishes. Think about if you're going to be presenting a, a set of images, how are you going to finish that set? Here, I finished it with the, um, all, the, all the bags covering the main street there. You just can't walk for bags and bags of water. And you know, they cleared it up incredibly quickly afterwards. I hope you found that discussion helpful and useful with your street photography. If you did, then please hit the like button, please comment below, and perhaps most importantly, please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon, because I'm going to be uploading plenty more videos on similar sort of topics over the coming months. And maybe join me on a Sunday night in my regular live stream where we, we go through things like this. And until one, whether it's a live stream or another video when, uh, uh, when I see you next, or rather when you see me next, <laughs> uh, thanks for watching and keep making great photos. Uh, bye for now.